What's happening? It's another protest, my priest. Caiaphas is the head of the Jews. He is an aristocrat. He is answerable both to his own people and to the, the Roman state as well. Did you know that Caiaphas, the respected high priest during Jesus' time, shared something shocking about the Messiah? His words reveal a hidden truth that could change the way we understand Jesus' death and resurrection. So what exactly did Caiaphas say? And how does it reshape our view of Jesus' sacrifice? Protecting his own power and preserving public order were now his highest priorities. And Caiaphas knew that Jesus must die. Chapter 1. Caiaphas, the High Priest In the course of Jesus' time on earth, a man named Joseph ben Caiaphas held one of the most powerful roles of the day, High Priest. Born around 14 BC and passing in 46 AD, Caiaphas's life and influence are recorded both in the New Testament and by well-known historians. His rise to power, though, wasn't just by chance. It was shaped by the politics of the time and a story of skillful maneuvering. It was in AD 18 that Caiaphas officially became High Priest, a title given to him by the Roman prefect Valerius Gratus. This decision came after Simon ben Setlus was removed, revealing just how much control the Romans had over who held this sacred role. What's even more surprising, Caiaphas stayed High Priest for nearly 20 years, a record among New Testament figures. This wasn't easy. He had to carefully manage the constant tension between religious duties and Roman rule, which was no small feat. His longevity in this role shows he knew exactly how to navigate these tricky waters of power and politics. But here's the real question. Why did Caiaphas and the other religious leaders feel they had to eliminate Jesus? And what was the disturbing prophecy Caiaphas experienced once their plan succeeded? Remember, Jesus' mission on earth wasn't a surprise or a twist of fate. The New Testament tells us that his purpose was set long before, to give his life for humanity. Jesus knew exactly what was coming, including when it would happen and who would be involved. In Mark chapter 14, verse 21, he even warned about his betrayal, saying, The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. This powerful statement hints at the betrayal ahead and the serious consequences for the one who betrays him. Yet, with all the plotting against Jesus, those who were trying to harm him didn't truly grasp who he really was. Even though Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin were disturbed by Jesus' teachings and actions, they hadn't actually seen him as an adult, which made it hard to identify him. To solve this, they needed someone from the inside who knew Jesus well. And that's where Judas Iscariot came in. Despite being close to Jesus, Judas struggled with some personal issues, especially his obsession with money. He'd also bought into the common belief that the Messiah would be a powerful leader ready to overthrow Roman rule. Because of this misunderstanding, he twisted Jesus' messages. So when Jesus spoke words like, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Judas saw them as promises of a military revolution, missing their true spiritual meaning. When Caiaphas and the religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus, Judas, with his messed up views and greed, became their guy. They were pretty disappointed that there hadn't been the big uprising they expected against the Romans. Judas eventually gave in to temptation and betrayed Jesus for his own advantage. His infamous betrayal came in the form of a kiss. This sneaky act helped the religious leaders identify Jesus among his followers. With that, they captured Jesus, setting off a series of events that would change history forever. Once Jesus was arrested by the temple guards, they didn't follow the usual protocol for his trial. Normally, he would have been held in the temple's holding area until the entire Sanhedrin, the full council, could gather. But strangely, they took Jesus straight to the home of the high priest, Caiaphas, in Jerusalem. The way Jesus was handled really stands out when you compare it to how others, like Peter, John, and other apostles, were treated during their arrests in the Book of Acts. Normally, people went through a set procedure, but with Jesus, things were done differently, and it has raised some big questions. First, this happened on the eve of Passover, a huge holiday in the Jewish liturgical calendar. It's a time for family gatherings, not trials, especially one involving a Galilean rabbi. Second, while Caiaphas's mansion was likely grand, 
It probably wasn't big enough to host all 71 members of the Sanhedrin on short notice. The way the Gospels describe it, Jesus was condemned quickly in a quiet, hidden setting. This makes it seem like Caiaphas was eager to handle the situation fast and under wraps, without the full council present. The secrecy of these late-night discussions suggests that there was a deliberate effort to rush through this process behind closed doors, skirting the usual rules. So what were the normal rules? According to Sanhedrin guidelines, a trial couldn't happen at night. Yet Jesus' trial did. Plus, trials couldn't happen during a major festival, which Passover definitely was. And if the Sanhedrin found someone guilty, they couldn't sentence them to death immediately. They had to wait overnight. Also, all trials were supposed to take place in the Hall of Hewn Stones, the official courtroom in the temple. But Jesus' trial happened in Caiaphas' house. Then there were strict rules about witnesses. At least two or three witnesses were required, and they had to agree on every detail. If a witness was found to be lying, they would face the same punishment as the accused. In Jesus' case, though, the witnesses didn't agree, yet they faced no consequences. From all this, it's clear that Jesus' trial wasn't exactly fair. According to John's account, Jesus was first questioned by Annas, Caiaphas' father-in-law and a former high priest, who held a lot of religious authority. After that, Jesus was taken to Caiaphas. Here's where things get tricky. Caiaphas had been high priest for around 12 years by then, taking over from Ben Ananias, his brother-in-law. Before Caiaphas could officially condemn Jesus, he needed the Sanhedrin's approval. If they didn't back him, Caiaphas would be stuck because he couldn't just order Jesus' execution. Without their approval, Caiaphas might have needed to involve the Romans. A big deal, since the Sanhedrin usually preferred handling their own matters without Roman interference. But this situation was filled with complications. Jesus was only accused of stirring up trouble and maybe saying things that some found offensive about God in the temple. But even with these accusations, there wasn't enough for the Romans to get involved, let alone put him to death. Caiaphas had to think carefully about what to do next. According to the Book of Mark, the hearing wasn't going as planned because the witnesses all had different stories. One person claimed Jesus said, I'll destroy this temple made with hands and in three days build another one not made with hands. While this might have sounded provocative, it wasn't really enough to justify serious charges. Many prophets in Hebrew history had spoken about the temple being destroyed, so Jesus' words weren't unique. Caiaphas then decided to change tactics. He asked Jesus directly if he was the Messiah. Jesus replied that he was and quoted parts of Psalms and the book of Daniel, saying that we would see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in clouds. This was from Psalms chapter 11 verse 1 and Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 to 14. Caiaphas recognized that phrases like the right hand of the power might catch the Romans' attention, so he tore his robes in frustration, asking why they needed any more witnesses. To him, Jesus' words were enough to condemn him, and Caiaphas felt the only solution was crucifixion, a slow and humiliating death. The religious leaders were outraged by Jesus' teachings and actions. His claims threatened their religious traditions, social status, and authority. By declaring himself the Messiah, Jesus was essentially saying he had more authority than they did, challenging their status and influence. To them, this was unacceptable. None of the Pharisees or other leaders believed in him. They dismissed the common people's faith in Jesus as ignorant and foolish. But as more people showed interest in Jesus, the religious leaders felt a growing resentment and jealousy. They saw Jesus' influence growing, and it threatened their own. Their anger only increased when Jesus performed miracles. For instance, when he healed a man possessed by a demon, people wondered if he could be the Messiah, even calling him the son of David. But the Pharisees refused to believe, saying that only Beelzebub, the prince of demons, could cast out demons. This claim, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 23 to 24, showed that they would rather believe Jesus got his power from the devil than admit he might be the Messiah. So they authoritatively decided that Satan must be behind Jesus' power. Jesus also challenged their religious system, often pointing out their hypocrisy. He saw through the flaws in their beliefs, and they wanted him dead for it. Additionally, the Bible tells us that Jesus entered the temple not once, but twice to drive out the money changers. 
When he arrived in Jerusalem near Passover, he found people selling sheep, doves, and oxen right in the temple, with money changers sitting at their tables. So he made a whip out of cords and drove everyone out, including the animals. He flipped over the tables, spilled their coins, and told those selling doves to take them away, saying, don't turn my father's house into a marketplace. His disciples remembered the scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. John chapter two, verses 17. The political atmosphere of Jesus' time only added tension to his actions. There was already a lot of strain between the Jewish community and Roman rule. Many Jewish leaders were anxious about the possibility of a Messiah, a figure many people hoped would be a military leader to free them from Roman control. The people dreamed of a powerful liberator, but Jesus' message wasn't about fighting for an earthly kingdom. He preached about a spiritual kingdom instead. This went completely against the idea of a militant Messiah. And let's not forget that Caiaphas made a surprising revelation about Jesus, something that would fuel their desire to bring Jesus down. Jesus' peaceful teachings and actions created a real problem for the religious authorities. He was drawing in large crowds, and they were worried not only about theological disagreements, but also about political consequences. They were afraid that the Romans might react harshly, threatening their way of life. So they felt they had to stop Jesus before he caused even more trouble. In those days, the religious authorities strictly enforced many laws, especially around keeping the Sabbath. But Jesus didn't hesitate to challenge those customs if they went against what he saw as true divine law. For example, he once healed a man on the Sabbath, Mark chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. Instead of sticking to their strict Sabbath rules, Jesus put people's needs first, showing compassion and kindness. This angered the leaders because it went against their strict observance and challenged their authority. To add fuel to the fire, Jesus once said that the temple would be destroyed and rebuilt in three days. John chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. He was speaking figuratively, but the religious leaders took it as an insult to the sacred temple, a symbol of their faith and authority. To them, Jesus wasn't just challenging their rules. He was questioning their very authority and the customs they held sacred. The religious leaders were offended by how Jesus ignored their customs, especially around the Sabbath. His words and actions went against the strict rules they were trying to protect. To them, he was a threat to their authority and the order they wanted to keep. So they decided that Jesus had to die. When Jesus answered, I am, to Caiaphas's question, are you the Messiah? Caiaphas and the others immediately took him to Pilate, wanting him executed. Only the Roman government had the power to order a death sentence, so they needed Pilate's approval. Caiaphas and the leaders accused Jesus of several things, including calling himself King of the Jews, which could be seen as perplexing Roman authority. But Pilate couldn't find any real reason to convict Jesus. Trying to avoid responsibility, Pilate sent Jesus to Herod because Jesus was a Galilean and Herod had authority over that area. However, Herod didn't find any fault in Jesus and sent him back to Pilate. Pilate, not wanting to condemn an innocent man, but facing pressure from the crowd, tried to offer a compromise. He suggested releasing either Jesus or a known criminal named Barabbas. But swayed by the chief priests, the crowd chose Barabbas and demanded Jesus be crucified. Reluctantly, Pilate gave in, washing his hands as a symbol that he wasn't responsible for Jesus' fate. Jesus then endured the painful journey to Golgotha, where he was crucified along with two other criminals. As darkness fell, Jesus spoke his final words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with that, he breathed his last, marking the end of his sacrifice for humanity. Chapter 2, The Crucifixion one of the most significant moments in Christian belief is Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, made for the forgiveness of sins. Christians remember this every year on Good Friday, just before Easter, which celebrates Jesus' resurrection. Although the Bible doesn't specify the exact timing, it's widely accepted from the Gospel accounts that Jesus was arrested on Thursday night and crucified on Friday. Good Friday. This would mean that everything, from Jesus' arrest to his death, happened within about a day. In that short period, the Last Supper, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus' trials all took place. Some Christian groups might interpret this timing differently based on their beliefs and traditions, and even historians still debate the exact year of Jesus' death. 
Most agree, though, that it happened in the early 1st century AD, with estimates generally between 30 and 33 AD. However, what about Caiaphas? What was his reaction when he heard the news of Jesus' resurrection? According to the New Testament, when the religious leaders heard that Jesus had risen, they tried to cover it up. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 to 15, the chief priests and elders paid off the guards who were watching Jesus' tomb, instructing them to spread a fake story. They wanted the guards to say that while they were asleep, Jesus' disciples came and took his body. This false story was an attempt to silence the disciples' claims of Jesus' resurrection and to counter the growing belief that it had truly happened. But here's where it gets really interesting. After all of this, Caiaphas had his own shocking encounter with the Messiah in a vision. This experience changed everything for him, and maybe even for history. Chapter 3. The High Priest Who Met the Risen Jesus While Caiaphas and the religious leaders tried to deny the resurrection of Jesus, he knew in his heart that Jesus had really risen from the dead. Ever since he heard the news, he'd been plagued by terrible nightmares. In his dimly lit room, he reflected on everything that had happened in Jerusalem. Archaeologists even discovered Caiaphas's home. What did they find? When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Caiaphas's guards treated him cruelly. Caiaphas asked Jesus, Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And when Jesus replied, Yes, I am, Caiaphas was furious and declared that Jesus deserved to die. After the Jewish council agreed, Caiaphas handed Jesus over to Pontius Pilate, demanding that he crucify this king of the Jews. In the days that followed, Caiaphas felt a growing darkness in his heart. Stories began to spread that the sky had turned dark when Jesus was on the cross and that the curtain in the temple had torn when he died. And despite the guards, Jesus had risen from the tomb. Could Caiaphas have misunderstood this extraordinary man? As high priest, it was his duty to verify those claiming to be the Messiah. But politics and jealousy had clouded his judgment. Now he was haunted by nightmares, weighed down by deep regret for condemning the one so many had awaited. Trying to clear his mind, Caiaphas washed his face and sat down in his study to review some important Hebrew prophecies. But instead of peace, he felt even more troubled. Suddenly, a voice behind him said, you condemned me so that you might go free. Shocked, Caiaphas turned and saw Jesus of Nazareth standing by his desk, surrounded by a gentle glow. With kind eyes, Jesus told him, this was my father's plan, to be the final sacrifice for everyone's sins. Caiaphas, stunned and overwhelmed, fell at Jesus' feet and cried. He only woke up when Annas, his assistant, shook him, asking what was wrong. After a long silence, Caiaphas whispered, This Jesus must be the Son of God. From that moment, Caiaphas' entire view of spirituality changed. He took off his high priest robes and left, while Jonathan, his subordinate, became the new religious leader. Caiaphas spent the rest of his days alone, filled with regret for what he had done against the Messiah. Hence, what exactly was found in Caiaphas's house? Chapter 4. Uncovering Caiaphas's House Archaeologists have discovered a grand mansion from the first century on Jerusalem's Mount Zion that could have belonged to Caiaphas, the high priest who condemned Jesus. Shimon Gibson and James Tabor, the lead archaeologists, explained that ancient Byzantine tradition pointed to this area as Caiaphas's possible residence. Plus, the mansion's close location to the Second Temple walls, built by King Herod, supports their theory. Why do they think this luxurious home belonged to the high priest? It's filled with rare features for that time. A three-pit oven, a private walk-in ritual pool, and even a separate bathroom. The ritual pool especially was something unique. It had to have running water flowing through it to allow for ceremonial cleansing. But what really caught the archaeologists' attention was a fancy bathtub they found on the site. According to Gibson, only three other bathtubs of this style and time have been found in Israel. Two in King Herod's palaces at Jericho and Masada, and a third in a priestly residence adjacent to Jerusalem's Jewish quarter. Gibson explained that the craftsmanship of this bathtub was so similar to those found in other high-ranking places that it's likely the same builders made them all. The team also found Murex sea snail shells here, which were used to make dye for religious garments. 
if this was indeed Caiaphas's house, it could have been where Jesus was first brought for trial. Chapter 5. Why Jesus' Resurrection Matters The rebirth of Jesus is central to Christian faith. First off, it proved he truly is the Messiah. He wasn't just an ordinary person, he was raised from the dead by the control of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus told his disciples several times before he died that he'd be resurrected, which no one in history had ever promised and then fulfilled. He was the only one who has ever done this. After he rose from the dead, many people saw him alive. The Apostle Paul wrote that over 500 of his followers saw Jesus at the same time. And he didn't come back as a ghost or spirit. It was his real physical body, the same one that died, buried, and was then brought back by God's power. To show he was real, Jesus even invited his disciples to touch him. He shared meals with them and talked with them, showing his deep love for them. Jesus also explained the meaning of his resurrection to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He reminded them that everything written about him in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. He opened their minds to understand that the Messiah had to suffer, rise on the third day, and that his resurrection was about repentance and forgiveness for all people, starting in Jerusalem. Without Jesus' resurrection, there wouldn't be a foundation for Christianity. The good news is built on three things, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Without these, there's no gospel, no Christianity. As it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 4, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Through his resurrection, Jesus triumphed over sin, its power, and all its penalties. Without this, humanity would remain captive to sin. Christian justification hinges it, as God credits Jesus' righteousness to all who believe in him. By faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, believers are treated as though they had never sinned. Jesus' resurrection brought his sacrificial blood into the throne room of heaven, fulfilling God's plan that forgiveness requires the shedding of blood. Jesus deceased and shed his blood on the cross for humanity's sins, and upon resurrection, he entered the Holy of Holies, offering his blood once and for all to secure eternal redemption, not through the blood of animals, but by his own. Through this, Jesus grants believers eternal life, showcasing his victory over death. He willingly laid down his life and took it up again, breaking the power of death brought into the world through Adam's sin. Jesus' reappearance also fulfilled his promise of the Holy Spirit. While on earth, Jesus assured his disciples he would send the Holy Spirit, a promise fulfilled by his resurrection. Now, as our eternal High Priest, Jesus intercedes for us at the right hand of God, giving believers direct access to God without further sacrifices for sins. Christians also believe that, as Jesus was resurrected, so too will his followers be raised. According to 1 John chapter 3, verses 2, believers will be transformed, receiving immortal, glorified bodies like his. Finally, Jesus' resurrection is a sign of his coming judgment, a clear assurance that God will fulfill his promise to judge the world righteously. If Caiaphas or other religious leaders had known that their actions would actually glorify Jesus instead of silencing him, they might never have pushed for his crucifixion. Caiaphas's role in Jesus' trial and his encounter with the risen Christ went far beyond his own story. Echoing through the growth of the early Christian church and the Jewish leaders' reaction to this new movement. After Jesus' resurrection, the early Christian community faced harsh persecution, mainly due to the Jewish authorities' fear of losing their influence. Caiaphas, even after stepping down as high priest, still represented the resistance against nascent Christianity. Jewish leaders worried that Jesus' followers would upset the delicate relationship between them and the Roman authorities. But the apostles were undeterred, preaching about Jesus' resurrection even when it meant facing prison or death. In Acts chapter 4, verses 18 to 20, Peter and John trial were commanded by the Sanhedrin, the very council once led by Caiaphas, not to speak of Jesus, but they boldly replied that they could only share what they had seen and heard. The message of Jesus' resurrection quickly spread across the Roman Empire, thanks in part to the Apostle Paul, who once opposed Christians, became a passionate advocate after his conversion on the road to Damascus. After his powerful conversion, Paul became a leading figure in spreading Christianity throughout Asia Minor, 
Greece and Rome. His letters to early churches, like those to the Corinthians, Romans and Ephesians, laid a strong foundation for the Christian faith, emphasizing Jesus' death and resurrection as its core. Ironically, the Jewish leaders' attempts to suppress Christianity only helped it spread. Persecution often forced believers to flee, taking the message to new places, as shown in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, after Stephen's martyrdom. By the end of the first century, Christianity had spread across the Roman Empire and beyond, building a global faith. Caiaphas's story reminds us that no human authority can stop God's plan. Jesus' resurrection, the cornerstone of Christian faith, continues to inspire believers worldwide with the promise of redemption and eternal life.